Well, first I'd like to acknowledge my uh, co-authors, uh, Chad Weaver, stand up if you're here in the room, Shimun Shim, are you here? There you are. Um, Dorada Kassel. Oh, what? Oh. Or O? Is she here? Well, Mr. Shim and, and, and O uh, did their master's project with this particular work. And uh, so that this is basically a summary of the data which uh, they generated over the past year. The work initiated. Work initiated in 1991, um, this works better. Okay. And I'm going to go over the uh, results to summarize those, talk about the experimental setup and the work that was done from 2012 to 13, discuss the data acquisition setup and results, and then, of course, a conclusion. Now, the 91 experiment was described in ICCF 17, and basically the idea was to uh, raise the temperature very rapidly. We were trying to do it as rapidly as possible after fully loading the titanium with uh, deuterium, creating titanium deuteride. And we did the loading uh, very carefully in the sense that we started the loading at room temperature and kept dropping the temperature. And as long as there were exothermic reactions, we just kept feeding it uh, more deuterium atoms until we got to liquid nitrogen temperature and then waited for exothermic reactions to subside. <laughs> then that particular device was then designed to uh, essentially heat it up very rapidly with boiling water. And we achieved heating rates of, I think, about 20 degrees C per second. Uh, interesting thing about this technology was that we did produce neutrons, but it didn't depend on needing any sort of high power source or fission or radioactive materials. This is a diagram of the 91 setup. Basically, it was a U-tube with titanium that was prepared very specially. It was 42 grams. It came from uh, Alpha ASAR, 99.5% pure sponge. But we took the oxide layer off, and then we basically crushed the sponge and then agitated it so that it was made up into smaller particles. Uh, then we pumped it down with a diffusion pump for I don't know, probably several weeks actually before we started the experiment and then basically we did the cooling phase and loading phase and we did see quite a bit of exothermic reaction that was measurable by the thermal couple <coughs> and uh, when we thermally shocked it we went through uh, four shocks where we recycled the titanium, cooled it down again, loaded, etc. It's the second shot that produced the interesting results. And then we got results from the third and fourth shot. This was our setup for measuring neutrons. It was uh, essentially polyethylene block with the device set in the center so that we can run hot water through it, just flow it through. And then two helium-3 detectors. We used a counting system, and in 91 it was difficult to get technology that would show you where the counts occurred in time. It was easy to accumulate counts. So we developed our own custom-made card. It was called an event timing card, and every time a neutron pulse uh, was uh, triggered, uh, it triggered the event timing card to put a timestamp on it. This particular custom-built card, given the state of technology back then, was 10K count capacity and about one microsecond resolution. 
you know, we used a decade counter just to do accumulated counts. And that decade counter had a one million count capacity. So basically, we also knew quite a bit about the efficiency. We knew the geometrical and detector efficiency. Those were done. First run had no burst. Second run was the huge run that produced uh, between 0.21 and 2.25 million neutrons a second over about five minutes. And it started during the shock. Third run also produced neutrons. And there were at least 127 million total neutrons produced. Fourth run was, was small, so the effect was diminishing. We analyzed the material for tritium, and it did have a little bit of tritium above background. So this basically is a representation of what we saw. Our counting card was saturated within 0.1 second approximately, so we had 10,000 counts in that time period. We measured it by stopwatch for the second burst here. After that, we had a computer glitch that we couldn't quite repair, so we didn't get any more counts with the event timing card, but we did see the uh, decade counter <coughs> go through uh, all the decades. And as you know, a decade counter was fill up the 10 of the 6 counts and then start over again. And you can just see it cycling through. So this is an approximate rendition of what we saw. So the question then is, can it, could we reproduce it in 2012? And this is the starting material. We had three types of titanium. We started with a sponge material that was also bought from Alpha ASAR, granules which we purchased from Alpha ASAR, and then a dehydrogenated titanium powder, uh, 325 mesh, also from <coughs> Alpha ASAR. Uh, basically, we built a <coughs> chamber very similar to 91, but our diagnostics was much better. Uh, Basically, the chamber very much looks like the old one. It has a U-tube uh, loading region. We had a catch tank, just like we did in the first experiment. Uh, vacuum system. This time, we used a turbo <coughs> pump. This is basically a, di or a, a picture of the two uh, chambers that we used for cooling and heating. <coughs> for physical parameter measurement, we had thermal couples like we did in the first experiment, type K. Those were connected to a bad acquisition system. Uh, we monitored the temperatures both inside and outside the chamber. We had a, a pressure gauge that was capable of going to 10,000 PSI. Uh, radiation detection equipment. We had helium-3 detector that we had used for a uh, IEC or inertial electrostatic confinement device. And that had been well calibrated <coughs> and uh, basically used for neutron countings with uh, our IEC. Uh, the experiment took place in the same room that we had the IEC located. Uh, we also had a leadlum BF3 neutron detector because our health physics department insisted we have it. C39 chips, <coughs> radio detector, thermalescent, uh, thermalescent uh, dosimetry badges. And this is uh, what the data acquisition system looks like, and coupled to the chamber. Uh, one of the things you want to do is really make sure the material is as pure as possible, very minimize oxidation on the surface. So everything was handled in a glove box under a helium atmosphere. Uh, so when we loaded the chamber, it was really a minimal exposure to impurities. And 
what we did is in terms of reporting this data is raw count rates. This is the detector. We don't take into account geometrical efficiency or detector efficiency. We have not yet calibrated that, but our best guess is that the two efficiencies together would be less than 0.4%. Our data acquisition system would count in 100 millisecond bins, so each count represents accumulation of neutron counts in 100 milliseconds. This particular result is with titanium sponge. What you see is that you get, well, sorry, you get bursts that occur. The highest burst was 164 uh, raw counts, that's neutrons per 100 milliseconds. This tells you the temperature at which they occurred at and the pressure. This is essentially the three parameters plotted together, counts, temperature, and pressure. And so anyway, temperature started low, thermal shocking, you can see that the shock produced um, a burst. And then the one that uh, was really the interesting one occurred in run four. I'll describe all the runs in a conclusion, but I'm just putting down two that I thought were interesting. This one used the dehydrated titanium powder, and during the loading, what was interesting is that it did produce a, uh, quite a bit of exothermic energy. There were temperature changes and pressure changes as it loaded. That seems to be a factor. The more exothermic reaction that you, you can see, the faster the rate that it loads, the better you're going to see a thermal shock event, more neutrons would come out. In this event, basically we had four or three uh, neutron bursts. An interesting one occurred right here. It had a raw count of 18,747 counts, which had 44% efficiency and 100 millisecond been, that's quite a few counts. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing is, if you look at the burst in terms of a compressed time scale, the burst occurred over a 10 minute time period, much like the 91 event. It started out small, but even this low level of neutron counts is still pretty high. It's in the 100 count range. And then it would go through and you see several bursts here that, that uh, came up above this low level until you reach this very high number of neutrons. The total number of raw neutrons counted, if you just sum it up, it's about 1.5 million total Brought neutrons that, that were counted in about a 10 minute time frame. Now, another interesting thing about run four was that about five days after this burst occurred, we pumped the system down with the turbo pump, took off all the equipment so there was no deuterium tank attached to it just set it aside and we were going to take it apart and analyze the titanium. <coughs> and during the weekend, after we had pumped it down, we came back and the chamber went from very high vacuum to 800 PSI. Uh, that was quite odd. Uh, we did the analysis, thought perhaps, you know, maybe it just spontaneously lost all the deuterium that was trapped in the titanium, but if you do that calculation, you shouldn't get anywhere near 800 PSI, you should get somewhere around 200, 300. Now, we did catch all of the gas, uh, 
or we caught it in our catch tank, and then of course we maintain a little bit of it within the YouTube. And one of the interesting things is that if you go to a commercial lab and you tell them, I have a gas sample I want you to analyze, and they'll say, sure, what's in it? And you say, well, we don't know, but we'd like you to look for deuterium, hydrogen, tritium, helium-3, helium-4. They'll say no. And the magic word is tritium. So that's what we've been fighting with, is trying to find a, a lab that would look for this, even though we don't know it exists. We just want them to look for it. And that's, that's kind of hard to do. Now, in summary, out of all the runs that we, we have made, and I think it's eight runs, is that right, O? Yes. yes. All of them produced bursts of some sort. Uh, two of them did not. We see the bursts occur at cryogenic temperature, close to the start of the shot, during the shot, and after the shot. But like I say, one of the interesting things about it is the best materials are the ones when you load, you actually see uh, temperature changes. You can see the exothermic reaction. Uh, you can see pressure change. Uh, those tend to give the best results. Now, in summary, the large burst in 2012 produced about 1.5 million raw neutron counts. Like I say, I can't give you an exact number of the source neutrons because we did not measure geometrical and detector efficiency. We think it's going to end up being low than 0.4%, so you can take that as an estimate. If you compare it to the 91 experiment, it produced about 100,000 raw neutron counts per second steadily over a five minute period. So fundamentally, the magnitude of the bursts, given the, the different efficiencies of the system were comparable, length of time was comparable. The best metal of we found uh, was the dehydrated titanium powder, although in 91 it was the sponge that gave us, that we used. So they both have similarities, large sustained neutron emissions, and I think that both of these are pretty much inconsistent with fracto emission, because with fracto you don't, don't see the sustainability, nor the magnitude. Now, what's an alternate explanation? I'll throw this out for consideration. That when you do rapid phase change in titanium, which does have a, I didn't put a phase diagram in here, which is unfortunate, it does have a very rich uh, number of deuteride phases it can go into, and at liquid nitrogen there is an epsilon phase that basically uh, has the highest deuterium to, to titanium ratio, and you can load it at about liquid nitrogen temperature. So when you rapidly heat the system, you're essentially following a uh, heating line changing pressure rapidly, temperature, deuterium comes out of solution, uh, and basically if your deuterium comes out of a solution at a rate that's faster than its ability to diffuse out of the metal, you can trap the deuterium and compress it. So my thought is that for these very large bursts that we see, this is a potential mechanism. Uh, of course, everyone understands the fractal emission, fraction of crystal, you get the electrostatic potential, drive high voltages, and get micro discharges. But again, the differences here are the magnitude of the burst and the length of the burst. 
This is much different than what we would see in fractal fusion for these very large bursts. Questions? Yeah. Um. Is there any possibility of measuring the energy of the neutrons? There is, and we were equipment limited. I have the, essentially the way to run <laughs> either a neutron spectrometer. I have several recoil spectrometers, uh, NE213, which I could run, but I simply didn't have the electronics to run the helium detector and, and the uh, neutron spectroscopy system simultaneously. But that's on the agenda. That will be uh, one of our next runs. Um, excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, I would like to know if, by any chance, you were uh, recording the variation of temperatures when the pressure went up to uh, 800 psi. Yeah. So, do you have a clue of um, how the temperature was uh, evolving when the titanium was well, the internal to the metal? Uh, that that's a more complicated issue, but outside pressure, yes, we, we plotted that pressure gauge. Pressure the temperature during the No, I'm, I've got a metallurgist working with me. Uh, he's going to try to do some calculations uh, based on setting up the heat transfer model and uh, phase change model. Uh, well, uh, I have a question. Maybe you you did a careful measurement, but how did you check about the electric noises and uh, and also you found that this kind of uh, neutron uh, with uh, together with other detectors simultaneously? Uh, well, in this case, we used the setup which was designed for the IEC. Uh, IEC is inertial electrostatic confinement. It's a huge RF generator, in essence. So basically, our system is well shielded, and we do neutron counting on that. Uh, we have essentially power conditioning devices. Everything is shielded by BNC cable, grounded. So we've run the IEC experiments for a facility five, six years, and uh, we never saw anything like this. I'd like to ask you for the possible correlation between parameters of neutron burst no. and registration of X-ray and gamma ray radiation. Time dependence correlation, huh? Time dependence is a more difficult question. We did have a sodium iodide sensor uh, to take spectra, and we didn't report any results because Basically, we didn't see any spectrum coming off sodium iodide. To do time correlation, that's going to be more difficult. I don't really have any equipment. But anyway, I thought your theory was interesting, so it might fit what we're seeing. Maybe we should talk. So this is all hot fusion, right? And you've done the correlation between the tritium that you saw and the amount of neutrons, or are you getting an anomalous branching ratio? Uh, in 91, yeah, we measure in tritium, but I'm not certain that, you know, we didn't. We can estimate how many neutrons were produced and how many tritium atoms. And yeah, I guess they roughly correlate. So, did I miss it? You measure tritium decay in the, in the modern experiment in 2012? No. That material is still in a uh, prep, well, it's in our YouTube, because we want to measure the gas first. And then the idea is we'll take it and analyze it for tritium. You have no problem with tritium gas. You don't? You yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> I should talk to you. <laughs> I'm sorry that we have to kind of hasten on, but uh, I just wanted to mention uh, similar works being reported by the Chinese Institute for Atomic Energy, South Beijing. And again, a number of other reports similar to this have occurred at Bob Atomic Research Center by Dr. Shrinivasan. I think this is an exciting area of study. And 
called white because Seth Goff is doing similar work whose patents about to issue on his work in the next two or three months. So I think this is a very interesting area of inquiry. Mark, thanks for an excellent presentation.